Hello, everybody, and welcome <laughs> to another FudsOnFilm.com podcast. I am Craig Eastman. I'll be your host for tonight. And with me, as always, Scott Morris. Hello there. And the man they know far and wide as Drew Tavendale. Hola. <laughs> Show off. M- multilinguist. <laughs> poly- polylinguist. <laughs> We've got a bit of catching up to do with some cinema releases tonight and some other stuff thrown in there as well. So without further ado, let us crack on. So then, someone talked to me about this low-budget indie film called Captain America Civil War. That little scene indie classic. It is, of course, Marvel Studios' latest in its Films for Babies series, and it will almost certainly be the biggest film of this year, so I'm sure enough of you have seen it, and the rest of you will have heard enough about it to make a detailed plot recap redundant, so you'll excuse me if I take care of that quite quickly and skip past all the layered subtleties that there aren't. (laughs) Tony Iron Robert Downey Jr. Man Stark is sad because normal people died off camera during a colossal alien invasion in the first Avengers film, and that boring robot city garbage in the second Avengers film, and during a terrorist incident at the start of this film, all of which would have been incalculably worse if they had been around to stop it. Nonetheless, if he's not swayed by some pretty shaky logic that the Avengers need some government oversight, there wouldn't be this film, so he is. (laughs) Steve, Captain Chris Evans' America Rogers, is sad because he posits a hypothetical (laughs) that governments... Sorry, your inflection there was amazing. (laughs) He posits a hypothetical that governments can't always be trusted or something along those lines and so doesn't want to be part of their so-called system, man. Heresy. (laughs) His position is also redolent with flaky logic and reasoning, but again, without that, there's not much of a film here. Those refusing to sign up to a new registration act are supposed to hang up their spandex and retire, but a personal crisis for Cap shows up when Bucky, Winter, Sebastian, Stan, Soldier, Barnes appears. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> having, <The third>. been, <laughs> having been activated by Daniel Brühl's Zemo. Brühl being probably the best thing in this entire movie, and he is also entirely underutilised because this is a garbage film for garbage people. <laughs> what with the Winter Soldier being a dangerous murderer and all, he's immediately put on a kill list, but Roger still thinks of him as his widow friend and undertakes <laughs> to break him pe- peacefully. <laughs> Which soon enough proves to be unviable, leading to the Avengers team splitting in half as some without any reference to logic, reason, motive or sanity take Roger's side in protecting a mass murderer against the rest of the team, who are cast as the villains somehow. Hashtag Brexit. (laughs) (laughs) This leads after an interminably boring hour and a half or so set up to what is in theory an exciting clash between the two opposing teams, but is really just another in this ceaseless parade of boring CG set pieces that the Marvel mainline films have dribbled their way. There's a few bright spots, Paul Rudd's Ant-Man gets perhaps the best lines and the only interesting CG moments, and Tom Holland's Spider-Man also gets his moments in, although it's really the introduction of Chadwick Boseman's Black Panther that gets the most screen time. Through no fault of his own, sadly, he's just another costumed freak clogging up the works and getting in the way of the story. (laughs) Captain America Civil War runs to nearly two and a half hours. What?! Two Mm -hmm. and a half hours, and there's a film in here that I like somewhere, but it's about one hour and eight characters lighter. (laughs) There's a hint here and there that the Russell brothers, who directed it, understand this, particularly the conclusion that stripped away most of the excess and brought it back to where it should have been all along. Bucky, Rogers and Stark throwing haymakers at each other in a grimy, disused facility. And I should note that this is exactly how I'd wished both Man of Steel and, to an extent, Batman vs Superman intended, so on a theoretical level at least I applaud this, even if I was so completely numbed by the preceding 89 hours of Black that I couldn't bring myself to care much about the actuality of it. Unfortunately for the rest of the film, the Russells and their ominous Marvel overlords have succumbed to the temptation to make this a full Avengers film in all but name, rather than the smaller scale Mm. side story that it should have been. As such, the massive star-laden returning cast are given about five lines each in which to vainly attempt to inject their personalities and character, leaving a film strewn with underserved side acts that are abandoned without hope of resolution, making the whole thing wildly unsatisfying on a dramatic level. A common fault among the serious Marvel Studios films, I think. They appear to be under the delusion that these paper-thin, computer-generated marionettes that populate their films (laughs) are in some way capable of having real human emotion mapped onto them, which is charming but completely divorced from reality. Delusional. Yeah, the the dafter entries, like Ant-Man, work by having an awareness of the stupidity of their situation. The serious ones are hamstrung by their pretense at being a real film with real characters, feeling real emotions, but their decidedly unreal characters are not the best suited for bearing that load. It doesn't help, of course, that the lead 
sheets are not in their best form. Chris Evans has never shaken the reports and the impression given by his turns that he doesn't much care for this role, and the normally charismatic and dependable Downey Jr. largely phones in this performance, with the exception of the odd flash in a couple of scenes, particularly those shared with the young Spider-Man. He's mostly asleep during this, really, isn't he? Yeah, it's a very underwhelming role. He's now, he's now but he needs a good nap now and again, doesn't he? <laughs> Oh, he's, he's probably tired from counting the like $812 million he's earned from this <laughs> film. <laughs> Largely to amuse myself and tangentially to annoy the more rabid fans out there, I've been reviewing this <laughs> in the style of the bulk of notices for Batman vs Superman. It's satire, see? Because I can't see for the life of me why that film got pilloried for its many logic and character issues, which are certainly there, where this film got a free pass by the same people for mystifying reasons, when it's clear to me that Batman vs Superman, for its faults, and there are many, asks much more interesting questions about heroism, had much better characterization, and motives for those characters' actions. Uh, substantially the superior film. Yeah, but, um, not fantastic characterization and motives, to be sure, but <laughs> anyone that claims that this film's better is huffing glue. Um, <laughs> largely, the only feeling Captain America Civil War was able to evoke from me was boredom, which appears to be Marvel Studios' endgame. This peculiar state of affairs is even lauded by some claiming as evidence how easy it is for all these characters to exist in the same universe when all that really means is that every character is blandly interchangeable with every other one and this film is a real showcase for that sure it's polished but in taking all the rough edges and spiky bits off it it's become a flat dull experience with no hooks at all the dc and x-men films certainly do many things worse than the marvel films and many things worse than this film but they do a lot of things better as well. You, you trade a mix of moments of greatness and abject failure for boring consistency. And well, your mileage may vary. I know which experience I prefer. Mm-hmm. Boring. Avoid. <laughs> so no strong feelings one way or the other, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Drew, I'm, quite, I'm piffling about this one, Scott. Yeah. I'm sensing that you may be erring on the side of Scott's opinion there, Drew. Well, well to use the word boring is to miss a perfect opportunity to use the word turgid, um, <laughs> which is the word I will use. <laughs> <laughs> which is a word we, we massively prefer. Yes, yeah, it is about four and a half days too long, this film. Hmm. Particularly the, the big set piece, which is a, and this isn't spoiling anything for the like three and a half people who haven't seen it, I'm not quite sure what the half person is. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. But there's a, a big set piece fight at an airport, which does last about four and a half weeks <laughs> with pretty much no consequence, apart from just showing up once again, the complete lack of understanding of any motivation of any character's actions, as Scott alluded to earlier. Um, and throughout this film, actually, there's something that really bothered me. You've got this idea that on this rather shaky debate about one person joining one side, one the other, you get, like, at least Captain America, Iron Man, get to say why they were on either side of it. And then everybody else sort of more or less divides up because. <laughs> but my particular no favourite is when Ant Man was like, oh, you phoned me. Great, thanks. It's like, <laughs> that, that's his motivation. He was phoned. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it, all sounds, it all sounds a bit playground bullshit to me. It is a bit. Um, <laughs> does at any know, like, point, does any of the Avengers shout at another Avenger, my dad will batter your dad? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then you've got one character basically betraying another character, and the motivation for that seems to be because. Uh, and just, there is no motivation, no explanation at all. It just seems to steer well clear, I guess a complete body swerve in fact, to anything with any real heft or depth in the politics. Because, yeah, like in Batman versus Superman, in the wake of Man of Steel and in you know, Bruce Wayne thinking that Superman's dangerous, Superman having to deal with what happened in Metropolis. The sort of, the consequence of actions there, that managed to at least get some weight into that and, and explore it at least a little interestingly. Yeah. Captain America Civil War just body swears entirely. There's no heft or depth in the politics whatsoever. And it's not like a film like this can't do that. And again, you, Scott, you mentioned the X-Men films earlier and that was a real sort of good example for me. I mean, they don't always do it great, but they've tackled really big issues with with real world analogues, particularly the Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, like analogues, the different ideologies of Professor X and Magneto, Mm. um, with both peril and consequence in the films, you know, trying to exterminate people. There's the mutant cure, that sort of thing. Magneto wanted to actually kill all humans. That they actually get into the politics and like why you would do that and feeling that there's an enemy there or, or whether you want to try and work with people, that sort of thing. So films from Marvel properties certainly have at least made a halfway decent fist of trying to cover something. But politics terms Captain America is so lightweight. It's crazy. It also suffers from the fact it thinks that character development is the same thing as adding more characters. (laughs) 
I know you, particularly Craig, during the Avengers were one of your big criticisms that there was no character development at all. Mm. And in this film, there is no character development at all. Other than possibly Tony Stark gets a bit more miserable. Well, there you go. There's an arc there. He blames himself for the death of somebody. And (laughs) Was it someone in the audience? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, to be fair, he's more developed than most of the rest of the Marvel Universe characters, but that's been, what, five minutes of character development over five films? Yeah. Mm. Six films now. (laughs) What this film did not need was more characters and they keep adding them. The one thing about this film I genuinely liked was Spider-Man. Hmm. But even then, that would have been better if that had, that would have been a great surprise in the middle of the film as opposed to being plastered over posters and trailers and everything for months now. Mm-hmm. Because Tom Holland, who was great in The Impossible, is, seems like a really good Spider-Man. He's really kind of enthusiastic. They've cast him actually as a, a younger person this time, a high school student like Peter Parker was always supposed to be. Seems like quite an interesting take on it. He's quite funny but inexperienced that character works well and it's the only thing that does because everything else is just making up the numbers then as for the rest of it like the weak motivations etc the film plays everything so safe it takes no risks at all it has no guts because it can't even bring itself to kill off minor characters (laughs) so basically this war and that's another thing i I want to pick up on with marvel have a complete misunderstanding of what words mean (laughs) because avengers age of ultron was basically the long weekend of ultron (laughs) And this civil war was basically a fight down the slabbies. You know, it's <laughs> Captain America pub brawl. Yeah, more or less, actually. But that's really quite an accurate way to put it. <laughs> so they misunderstand both age and war. So you've got this film with pretensions of grandeur that it's, it takes itself so seriously, but it's so incredibly lightweight with weak or missing motivations There is basically no consequence for anything that happens. And it's more or less a zero-sum game for all the characters because by the end, nothing feels like it's changed. Uh, Five stars. I'm afraid it's just not a very good film at all. I generally don't understand how people can think that this is the lesser film of this and Batman vs Superman. As Scott said, it's against Batman vs Superman certainly has its problems. But it at least gives a good go at actually trying to tackle something, having some weight to the characters. I was worried about this film back from when it was first announced, and I kind of did some reading a bit about the storyline from the comics, and then I stumbled across an interview with the guy what Dunn wrote them, whose name I can't recall quite now, but he was basically saying, why did you write this storyline? I thought it would be nice to have Iron Man and Captain America fight. And that's really the level of depth that's been put into it, the, level, mm-hmm. the depth of thought that's been put into this. It's just vapid. Yeah, and that's basically so they can, film-wise, it's so they could have that big CGI set piece, which it's it comes, even actually if it wasn't just a, um, a CGI fest, but as you mentioned, Scott, I mean, we keep on measuring, we have done for years now in, our, in a previous incarnation as well. When it's when you know something is just a big bunch of pixels smacking seven shades out of another big bunch of pixels, it's so hard to care. But even if it wasn't, I just it just goes on so long and it just seems to have no consequence. It's just there to be spectacle with nothing attached to it. Yeah, not impressed, not impressed. No, I suspect at 15 minutes, I suspect we've already allotted too much time to this beast based on you guys, your opinions. I haven't seen it. So we had a bit of feedback on social media. Drew? Yeah, this is just a tweet from Lewis Clark at Sonic Yoda on Twitter, who said that for him, Captain America was a very average movie bogged down with politics. Some great spectacle when it wanted to go nuts, though. Thanks for the feedback, Lewis. Very much appreciated, as always. We'll have some more feedback from some of our listeners later in the show. But right now, we're going to move on to the colony, Drew. Yes, the colony. The 1970s were, put it mildly, dark times for Chile, particularly from 1970 three onwards when Thatcher's old pal Augusto Pinochet led a military coup to overthrow Salvador Allende's government. Families were broken up, people disappeared, human rights were a mythical thing, many questions remained unanswered, many wounds are still raw and many families still never found out what happened and it means that that time and that place would be ripe grounds for a scintillating and frankly heart-rending drama. Sadly, in the colony, all of that background is more or less incidental. The totalitarian nature of Pinochet's rule allowing the events to occur, but otherwise not really impacting on the story. As to the story, Daniel Brühl's Daniel is a German activist and photographer, a supporter of Allende, who is rounded up by police after the coup d'etat when he attempts to take photographs of the atrocities taking place in the streets of Santiago. He is then sent to Colonia Dignidad, a camp run by Nazi cult leader Paul Schaefer, 
played by Michael Nyquist, who oversees the regime of emotional, physical and sexual abuse of the followers. Learning of Daniel's fate, his flight attendant girlfriend Lena, played by Emma Watson, infiltrates the camp by the incredible expedient of turning up dressed in dowdy, almost nun-like clothes and asking, can I come in please? And she gets in. That simple, apparently. In possibly the least well thought out rescue plan ever, she then proceeds to spend several months being humiliated, drugged and working as a slave so that somehow she can save him. Yeah, definitely <laughs> the best thought out plan I've ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Daniel is going around pretending to have been brain damaged after the torture he endured on his survival and is using this as a cover to take photographic evidence of what is happening at the colony. In the end, the story is too generic and too filled with melodrama, last minute miracles and time sensitive dramatic imperatives. Now, Colonia Dignidad was a real place and the tone of this film does not fit well with the true life soul destroying horror of it all. It suffers also from more or less abandoning the events of the outside world after the opening scenes and also from being from the perspective of two foreigners rather than native Chileans with far fewer resources and avenues of aid. It also swerves away from an exploration of the psychologies of cults or exactly what they were doing to aid Pinochet's regime in the camp and instead settles for this cult is cruel and brutal, what more do you want? (laughs) Uh, We are the robots. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) The dialogue is full of cliché, and the colony also does that bizarre thing of being set in a Spanish-speaking country but having everyone speak English. Now, that's okay if you intend... <laughs> a bit like Benidorm. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's okay if you intend to sell primarily to Anglophone audiences. Okay, that I understand. But then, sometimes, and this is the, it's, it's a common thing too, then sometimes they speak Spanish. <laughs> by by suspension of disbelief. All the people who speak Spanish is English apart from when they're speaking Spanish. Well done. <laughs> More show-offs. You're not the only polylinguist then, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> After all that, I did actually enjoy this a little, at least in a, a pot boilery sort of way. But this one goes firmly into the missed opportunity category. Brule is a hugely gifted actor and Watson is at the very least very capable and with such an interesting and important setting in time and the fact that the place was real and all sorts of international political collusion protected it, then this could have been a truly fascinating story. Unfortunately though, I probably couldn't recommend it. I mean, if you're a fan of Emma Watson or Daniel Brule, maybe you want to check it out, but it's just, it misses what could have been a, a much more worthy film. Boo! Uh, thanks for that, Drew. Scott, I have one eye on the running order here, and it tells me that you've got one eye in the sky. What a link! <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. I tell you, I'm wasted on yes, this, I- not just generally speaking. <laughs> I'm very drunk. <laughs> Yes, drones. They're increasingly what's for dinner in modern warfare. Where <laughs> <laughs> the treat you can eat between battles. Yes. Where remote-controlled flying missile platforms can mete out explosive vengeance without the need for any of that troublesome habeas corpus due process day in court nonsense that really just does get in the way of justice while also being the basis of it. Still, all's fair in love and war, particularly if you love war enough to declare it on a noun, such as terrorism, which means <laughs> there's also the delightful frisson of invading territory without any of that messy boots-on-the-ground garbage. And that's where Eye in the Sky makes its entrance, the latest entry in the small but growing slice of cinema examining drone strikes. Colonel Catherine Powell, played by Helen Mirren, is in command of a joint USA-British mission to provide visual reconnaissance to support a local Kenyan operation to capture a high-value target who's supposed to be meeting with a local cell. Things go sideways when the meeting venue changes to a house in a town entirely under militia control, making his capture infeasible. As soon as some young terrorist recruits appear and start donning explosive vests, it becomes one of those ticking time bomb situations, forcing Powell to reclassify it as a assassination mission, or targeted kill as I believe they're PRing it these days. Much to drone pilot Steve Watts, Aaron Paul's dismay, uh, given the collateral mayhem a Hellfire missile can cause in an urban area. He pulls out the book on his superior, forcing Powell to confirm that they have the legal authority on this strike, which seems certain to cause the death of a young girl who is coincidentally selling flatbread from the back of a neighbouring house on the outskirts of a market. This triggers a procession of people kicking the decision upstairs throughout the military and political channels to the highest levels of the British and USA governments. Meanwhile, the delicate work of actually keeping tabs of the situation falls to undercover Kenyan agent Jama Farah, played by 
Mark Adapti, who must black his way into the town and pilot a small surveillance drone locally, putting his life at risk if discovered and providing some real moments of tension as the diplomatic ping pong continues. There's obviously been a few dramatic shortcuts taken to give the strike decision more of a moral quandary. It shouldn't really make a difference that the threat is to an innocent young girl from a family that were explicitly shown rejecting the radical Islamic tenets of those who have taken over their hometown, but of course it does. Likewise, the imminent threat is another shortcut to force a quick decision, but both should really be irrelevant to the main question. Is extrajudicial assassination ever warranted? It's not well, my- if, you, if, if you have a business model as poor as selling flatbreads out the back of your house, I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not my place to answer that for you. Though I imagine you've picked up on my general feelings on the issue, but I in the Sky does a really good job of prompting you to answer the questions that it's raising without ever appearing to be heavily handedly taking its own position. There's reasonable arguments to be had on both sides, at least the way they're presented here. The cast is uniformly excellent, not just Mirren, Abdi and Paul, but all the supporting cast, which includes the likes of Ian Glenn, Jeremy Northam, Phoebe Fox and Alan Rickman in what's sadly one of his final roles. There's a very well-judged mix of tension caused by the situation and frustration to the point of laughability by the panicked responsibility dodging on display from the political side of the equation, which all adds up to one of the most compelling films about the war on terror since The Hurt Locker. Indeed, my only complaint is less with the film and more with the world, as it feels that disregarding whether you're pro or anti drone strikes, this film unwittingly hints that they're all given this level of intense scrutiny. The actuality of the frequently indiscriminate nature of these strikes and the unashamedly massaged figures on the effectiveness of the targeting, such as the disgusting trick of arbitrarily determining that any of-age male killed in a drone strike is definitely a terrorist until proven otherwise, and the rate at which these strikes occur, adds up to a process that's plainly not overburdened with oversight. (laughs) (laughs) I have no idea you were such a left. Fifty, Scott. <laughs> yes. Um, what are you worrying for? But none of the above is I in the Sky's fault, and indeed it's to its credit that it raises these questions and provokes these thoughts, making it definitely one to put on your watch list. It's a very emotive issue, more so now than ever, actually, so yes. Because there's so much that could be really interesting to approach there because it, it's such a, a genuine hot potato politically just now. There are so many moral issues surrounding it and how it affects people when you're doing things from, like, remotely. Hmm. Um, so yeah, certainly something I want to catch up on. It sounds very interesting. Me too. I don't too. think it's going to be the first, or rather the last film that focuses on that sort of type of warfare no. in the next few years. What was the Ethan Hawke one recently? Last year, maybe? Was that a good ago? kill? I think. Yes, that's right. I haven't seen a good kill. I can't remember how it measured up. Oh, you wouldn't remember if you've not seen it. No, you know what I mean. <laughs> I can't remember what the general opinion of it was. <laughs> Drew, if I can throw to you for a second, we've got some feedback on social media. Yes, friends at Backrow Podcast, at Backrow Films on Twitter, said that Eye in the Sky is one of the biggest surprises of the year for them. Tense, hilarious and moving, the Doctor Strange love of the 21st century. <laughs> it's high praise indeed. Yes, um, it's a very good podcast incidentally, but uh, yeah, I can, I can see where they're going. There's certainly elements of just real absurdism, mainly on the political side. Eye in the Sky has a bit more impact in terms of its dramatic chops, largely because there are so many drone strikes occurring around the world you know, on a fairly frequent basis, whereas by the time I'd got around to watching Doctor Strange Love, I was fairly certain we weren't going to get nuked. So there's a kind of interesting sort of difference in, in the kind of level of drama that you can apply to those two things, but certainly there are mm-hmm. comic elements there, but uh, the drama overpowered the comedy in, for me in the Sky. But certainly, yes, still a, a, a solid recommendation from them too. Drew, if we can move on to Alice through the looking glass... Can you tell me a little bit about that, please, sir? I can, I can. It's very kind of you. You're welcome, sir. I shall buy you an ale. It is, rather frighteningly, when I looked this up, six years since Tim Burton first brought his take oh. on Lewis Carroll's classic to the screen. Where's it gone, boys, eh? Where's <laughs> it gone? Although, really, I should, what I should say, it's six years since Tim Burton first brought his take on Lewis Carroll's classic the screen because I do not care for this story at all. <laughs> uh, it's maybe not making you the best person to review this, but let's see. Uh, after that film raked in a frankly astonishing one billion dollars at the box office, there was always going to be a sequel, however tardily it arrived. Directing duties here are taken over by James Bobbin, with a script once again written by Linda Wolverton. Burton's film played fast and loose with the source novel and actually used a substantial chunk of material from Alice to the Looking Glass itself, so this film film really shares little more than a title with Carl's second tale of Alice's adventures. After returning from a sea voyage on which she was captain, Alice returns home to find some domestic issues threatening to turf her and her mother out of their home. 
Unfortunately, before we get too bedded down in these rather dreary matters, Alice finds herself pitched into Underland once more through the mechanism of the titular looking glass. There she reunites with her friends and finds out that the Mad Hatter is dying. He has been reminded of a tragedy from his childhood, but is now convinced that his family, whom he had thought dead at the claws of the Jabberwock, are alive. Nobody believes him, so Hatter is intent on sulking himself to death. <laughs> As you do. (laughs) As you do, yeah. Until Alice agrees to help him for some reason. And I say for some reason because Depp's Mad Hatter is every bit the tiresome, eccentric, wacky, irritating, flip (laughs) presence that he was in the first film. Agreed to help him, she does. Though, to this end, Alice sets off to Time's Castle to obtain the Chronosphere, a device that will allow her to travel back in time and discover the fate of the Mad Hatter's family. By doing so, though, she risks destroying the universe and time itself. So, no big stakes there then. (laughs) And the personification of time chases her to recover the device. Uh, Time is played by Sasha Baron Cohen, and he really is the high point of the film. Even if his choice of a herzog s accent is a little peculiar. (laughs) I'm not really sure what the motivation for that one was. Not that he strikes too high, but he's pretty far above most everyone else. Helena Bonham Carter's huge noggin Red Queen returns, but she mostly whines like a spoilt brat and doesn't have the requisite glee in the character that might make it actually work. Though she does have an origin story, which is obviously what everyone was crying out for from Alice in Wonderland. (laughs) Anne Hathaway is wooden, as she was in the first film. There's a terrible Scottish accent from Paul Whitehouse for us all to get deeply offended by. Oh no. And... Mia Vashakovska is game as a heroine, but never really stretched. And it is sad to hear, albeit briefly, Alan Rickman's sonorous tones, though even if Bobbin had had more time with him, I doubt it would have helped. In this film though, and I realise that the certainly this could be quite different for other people, the visual style is what bothers me most. While it's a fantastical place, and is therefore necessarily computer generated, it shares with its predecessor that same deep ennui engendered by such a willfully unrealistic place. There are moments of interesting design, Times Castle and its inhabitants being the most notable. There are sort of like use of time-based metaphors for the characters and their actions, which is actually quite clever. But it's frankly visually exhausting and offers mm. numerous opportunities to use the word lurid instead of a more appealing colourful. <laughs> now, if you like the style, then I imagine you'll get a lot more from this film than I did. Though it just it rattles through the different fantastical locations without really revelling in them as it might. It's one of those films that's very much more spectacle than content. I'm style over substance, and I don't really care for the style of it, so this film did not do a great deal for me at all. Sounds very much like my observations of the the first movie, so I'm not going to rush to see this. An interesting point I think was brought up on the Back Row podcast, actually. Uh, Given the amount of money that the first film made, everyone must have seen the first film. Does anyone like it? I've I've never met anyone who liked that first Alice in Wonderland film. Not that it comes up in conversation all that much, but it's never been top of anyone's (laughs) list for decent films at all, but somehow it's massively successful. Strange. Yeah, and really, when I was looking up after I saw this and looking up this information, I was like, a billion dollars. <laughs> and that was box office. I don't think that's yeah. um, DVD or anything either. A billion dollars for that film. I just, and I remember being so underwhelmed at the time. I know, there's no rhyme or reason to it, man. And there's that horrible thing, and I mentioned on Ellie, but that, that horrible thing that falls into this film as well of just, when you know nothing's real and you just, your brain can tell. And again, it's a bit different from, say, like a Star Wars prequel where this is fantastic. There is no way to do it practically, really. But... You just know that the characters are so, the actors are so confined mm. and they're not anywhere real and it affects performances and it affects just how you feel about it and it just becomes really kind of tiresome. I rather suspect though this is not going to do anything like the billion dollars that the first one did, although it, objectively it's probably a better film. It'll, it'll probably make enough. I mean, Lewis Carroll didn't write a third entry in the series, did he? So <laughs> we can look forward to not having a third unless someone wants to <laughs> expand the Alice cinematic universe. Well, that's what they'll do anyway, though, because this film has no. nothing to do with the source cut material apart from the characters' names, basically. Yeah, I suppose that option's always open to them, isn't it? Probably shouldn't joke about it, lest I will it into existence. On to 10 Cloverfield Lane then, Craig. Oh, thank you, Craig. You're welcome, <laughs> Craig. Uh, ten cl- <laughs> I'm just knocking them out of the park tonight. Seamless. 
The movie stars Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Michelle, a young woman who, following a car accident, wakes up in an underground shelter in the company of its owner Howard, played by John Goodman. After a decidedly awkward introduction, Howard informs Michelle that there is no possibility of her leaving the shelter, the purpose of them being down there, that there has been some sort of attack, possibly nuclear or chemical, on US soil, and that in all likelihood, everyone they know has already died. I'll take the edge off your day. Michelle soon learns that there's a third occupant of the bunker, Emmett, with whom she has some rapport, though their easy friendship seems to reveal something of a temper on Howard's part, and in combination with his increasing descent into right-wing paranoid conspiracy nut invectives, the pair begin to understand that all is not as it seems, and that the greater danger may actually come from their host. Now, 10 Cloverfield Lane began life completely apart from the universe of its bigger cousin, before J.J. Abrams snapped up the script and administered gene therapy. (laughs) <laughs> An intriguing idea, certainly, but on this occasion it proves something of a double-edged sword with one side considerably sharper than the other. Feature debut director Dan Trachtenberg, by all accounts, plays a blinder when asked to work on a tight, minimalist, claustrophobic thriller out of very limited resources, and the result belies his lack of experience behind a clapperboard to an almost astonishing degree. His cast are also uniformly excellent. We already know John Goodman can turn on a dime, and here he gives a superb rendition of a believably unhinged survivalist loon with just enough threat and nuance to stop the character from taking what would be an understandably easy slide into caricature. John Gallagher is also excellent as Emmett, whose compassion and relative innocence play nicely against Howard's dark edges, but it's Winstead who makes the most of her material in portraying a refreshingly resourceful female lead, Mm -hmm. the likes of which we'd rather like to see more of, if you please. I've always personally found Winstead to be particularly engaging, but since 2011's disappointing pre-make of The Thing, it seemed her Hollywood career had been all but cut loose by the studios. I'm happy to say, however, that she's back with a vengeance here. Uh, And if this performance, her best since Scott Pilgrim, if you haven't seen 2012 Smashed, and you haven't, coupled with the box office returns the movie reaped don't revitalise her fortunes, then frankly, I don't know what will. The issue comes with the movie's final act, uh, whereupon the cut and weld of Abram's intention becomes woefully apparent. (laughs) Working 95% of the way toward a nerve-jangling climax, the movie suddenly skids jarringly to a halt, whereupon someone appears to splice in footage from some other movies that (laughs) I won't name-check in order to avoid spoilers. As I said before, there is an intriguing intent behind the overarching narrative play being made in this final act, but it's been so badly mishandled by the studio, not Trachtenberg, that it pretty much pulls the rug out from under the preceding 90 minutes and dissolves all goodwill in a vat of borderline (laughs) farce. What's most upsetting, and this is the bizarre thing, is that Abrams could quite easily have had his cake and eaten it with the material already in the movie, if only he'd left the final 60 seconds intact and removed the preceding five minutes from the script. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to see why the denouement has split audience opinion, and in fact the only surprise for me has been that it's split at all. Still, the studio will be pleased with the budget to box office ratio, which is firmly toward the Blair Witch rather than the Heaven's Gate end of the scale, and I do suppose that 95% of a great movie is better than no percent of a great movie or (laughs) Furious 7 as I like to call it. The only joy that I took from the switch at the end of this movie, the stylistic switch, is that only on one occasion have I ever seen my wife more angry and (laughs) and I have no intention of telling you the reasons why there because you wouldn't like me anymore. I just bizarrely mishandled J.J. Abrams, the man who stood in front of a TED audience and gave a talk about a mystery box (laughs) and the benefits of the mystery box and how it serves narrative so well. And here he's made his mystery box out of optically clear glass. (laughs) I'm assuming from the various grunts of what I take to be agreement that you gentlemen are largely on board, Drew? Oh yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead is fantastic in this and what is so refreshing is her resourcefulness. She she wakes up in this place and immediately is thinking, how do I get out? How do I turn this to an advantage? Not, oh, woe is me, something bad has happened. Oh, I was the damsel in distress. Nothing like that. From the get-go, she's been resourceful, clever, defiant, and that's genuinely, genuinely refreshing. Mm-hmm. John Goodman is fantastic. I mean, we have been big fans of John Goodman for a long time, from his Barton Fink and The Big Lebowski and oh, Brother We Were Out of the Days. And st- Roseanne. Um, <laughs> Roseanne. And then just in you know, the last few years to just knocking out of the park with his cameo in Hail Caesar mm. and then just his double act with Alan Arkin in Argo. Uh, it's just, he's fantastic. And in this, he does have that sort of kind of menace underneath the surface that you just feel that he could just switch anytime and just go full on 
crazy or dangerous and he's kind of just trying to keep a lid on that and mm-hmm. it's really entertaining to watch through that film you've got the tension and you don't know what's going on whether what you've been told is true or not all that is really well handled and i find myself quite engaged in the film and then it gets to the last five minutes part of the problem is the fact that the cut and shut of the two films and it's also the fact it's called 10 cloverfield lane gives away a big chunk of stuff mm-hmm. like why have you given it a name which will wreck half of the tension of the film if yeah. it's got that name it's I do not understand the thinking there. Maybe putting it in the same universe? Mm-hmm. Possibly, yes. Okay. Giving it that name. Yeah. This is what I mean about the interest in art that are playing. I actually quite like the notion of what Abrams has uh, has set out to do here. Yeah. It's intriguing to me that he's taken what was pretty much a, a low-budget movie to begin with, but every couple of years they're going to pick some project and just sort of scatter out all these supplemental uh, little branches to the storyline elsewhere, mm-hmm. you know, little, I think, blood relatives, as he referred to it, these little branches of the Cloverfield family tree. I kind of like what he's doing there, but mm-hmm. it's just been so bizarrely mishandled. Yeah, it's getting really ham-fisted. It's um, baffling, absolutely baffling. and so discordant. You say, like, maybe, like, you know, leave the last 60 seconds in and then cut out five minutes before. Yeah. Certainly, even from... It's like a, a revelation towards the end. And like, even if it just stopped at that point, I'd have been okay with it. Mm-hmm. It's more just like, so something is confirmed one way or another. And then, then if it stopped there, that would be fine. But mm-hmm. then it just, it cuts and pastes five or six minutes of an entirely different film and a completely different genre. Mm-hmm. And it does not fit in there at all. It sticks out like the sorest of sore thumbs. Mm-hmm. And it's so disappointing because really the rest of it had been so entertaining to that point that I, just, I don't, know what the thinking is because it clearly doesn't fit mm-hmm. most bizarre most bizarre and scott yourself well, I, I won't belabor any points I, I pretty much agree with everything you've said uh, apparently i wasn't so put off by the genre whiplash moments at the end i still overall enjoy the film and would recommend it mm-hmm. but yes it is just strange that it could have been done better by cutting quite a bit <laughs> of what was added at the end out um yeah strange but uh, yeah i think it's still a pleasant little surprise and it's worth looking at mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but yeah just a bit of a missed opportunity i think for something really good like like I said, the biggest reward from this will come if Mary Elizabeth Winstead gets a leg up again and we get to see her in some more better material than uh, than, <laughs> than a good day to die hard. Drew, if I can throw to you again briefly, what are our friends on the Twitters saying about it? Okay, first of all, Sonic Yoda again said, 10 Cloverfield Lane is stunning. John Goodwin shouldn't be turning in performances like that at this point in his career. And our good old friend Matt Toller, at M Toller on Twitter, said that, 10 Cloverfield Lane is something that he likes the idea of. He likes the idea of a loose brand for experimental horror, mm-hmm. but felt that 10 Cloverfield Lane overstayed its welcome and wore a little thin. Would have made a decent anthology entry. Yeah. And he said also, I see what they were going for casting Goodman, but for some reason he has a hard time buying him as menacing. Might just be me. I think it's just you, Matt. <laughs> we were all on board with the good one. I think you nailed it there with the loose, uh, sorry, what was Matt's turn of phrase there? The loose brand for experimental horror. Yes, that's that's what I was trying to get at with my babbling earlier. That's quite succinctly put, Matt. I agree with you 100% on that. But yeah, I would I would also agree with you, Drew, that just Matt's just wrong. I accept, <laughs> I accept Goodman. I would be terrified if I was in that bunker with Goodman, even if I knew he was John Goodman. <laughs> See, the problem is, we spoke to Matt a little bit after that, when he said that comment at first, and Matt was saying that he just couldn't believe that Walter could get you a toe of that this afternoon. Like, I believe that of Walter and of John Goodman, quite yes. frankly. So. <laughs> yeah, of both. <laughs> but it's all right, Matt. We know you're a good guy. We still like you. Scott, you are going to offer us up some X-Men Apocalypse. Yes. If we had to explain what's happened to the X-Men universe's timelines over the past few films, we'd be here all day. So let's politely skip over the timeline resetting implications of Days of Future Past and just call this a sequel to First Class, which isn't far away from accurate. Besides, at the start, we're headed back in time again, this time to kick off with Apocalypse, played by Oscar Isaac, the nasty git is ruling over ancient Egypt in his role as most powerful mutant, but Rebels seize an opportunity to off him during a ritual that we later find out lets him claim the powers and vitality of other mutants, which is how he became so powerful in the first place. Taking advantage of this moment of vulnerability, they attack, but are partially thwarted by his minions, with Apocalypse left in suspended animation rather than cessated. It remains that way until he's stuck up by cultists in the heady future of the 1980s, whereupon he goes about assembling a new squad of elite goons, gaining their trust with promises of ruling a new world and also by enhancing their powers. His new wingmen are a young thief who can control the weather, best known as Storm, played here by Alexandra Ship. 
an arse-kicking, cyblade-wielding Psylocke, played by Olivia Munn, a literal wingman in the shape of winged brawler Angel, played by Ben Hardy, and finally, our favourite metal-bending madman, Uri Geller. No, wait, Magneto, played by (laughs) Michael Fassbender. Magneto had apparently settled down and became a family man after being thwarted in first class, but after saving a fellow worker in a iron foundry from a squashy iron-based demise, his cover is blown, attracting the attention of the fuzz. When sent to arrest him, they accidentally kill his wife and daughter, giving him just the right blend of rage and nihilism to jump on board with Apocalypse's master plan of kill everyone. It's never particularly well explained, but it seems to be of the general survival of the fittest, destroy all this decadent comfort to forge us into better, stronger, faster people kind of deal. Oh, apocalypse, you daft punk. (laughs) Just the sort of thing you'd need the X-Men to counter, except unfortunately they don't really exist. With peace having more or less broken out in the last decade or so, the spandex has been retired around Xavier, James McAvoy's school, in favour of actual teaching for once. Hank McCoy, played by Nicholas Out, or Beast to his mates, is still around to mentor the new generation of young uns, including powerful telepath Sansa Stark, so, sorry, Jean Grey, played by Sophie Turner, and the boy with kaleidoscope laser eyes, Scott Cyclops Summers, played by Ty Sheridan. They get the band back together when shape-shifting mystique Jennifer Lawrence shows up, with Kurt Nightcrawler Wagner, Cody Smith McVee, in tow, having saved him from a beating at the hands slash wings of Angel. She warns them of the coming threat, and after a bit of armed twisting convinces Xavier to get back onto a war footing and train up the youngsters to fight alongside them. And also the returning sports racer Quicksilver played by Evan Peters shows up wanting to talk some sense into his unknowing father Magneto. And so it goes with yet more landmark buildings being destroyed by a CG and with the punching and with the kicking of eh? <laughs> The CG battles look fine but their main interest really only comes in seeing the new mutants show off their powers. Dramatically the fights are a little flat with all of these blockbusters the fight final act kind of suffers accordingly. Now, X-Men Apocalypse gets an easier time for me than Civil War because a lot of the earlier CG showcases are rather more imaginative than the Marvel outing, particularly a Quicksilver scene that is admittedly similar to the previous example but no less brilliantly enjoyable for it. Likewise, for all of my bitching about the Civil War's cacophony of characters, which is just as prevalent here, they're all given moments in direct service of the main conflict, as opposed to Civil War, which was using them as sequel hooks. Also, by this point in the franchise, you can count on McAvoy and Fassbender being familiar enough with the characters to provide the moral conflict effectively and efficiently. Sadly, the actual physical conflict is rather less interesting, not just in terms of the CG finale, but Apocalypse as a character isn't all that interesting, and poor Oscar Isaac's not really given very much to do at all other than issue an entirely generic series of standard issue megalomaniacal rats. So, even if it ends with a bit of a whimper, the preceding two hours are entertaining enough although again it could do with losing at least half an hour of it. Of course part of the entertainment comes from the prequel trilogy's different time frames so it's a veritable cavalcade of 80s references to enjoy or be irritated by depending on your outlook. The X-Men universe has always done a better job of mixing the drama with enough levity to keep things fun and it's really here that DC should be looking for inspiration rather than Marvel Studios output. What it shouldn't be doing is sniffing their own farts to the degree that Brian Singer has of late, calling the X-Men series grounded (laughs) and serious, which shows a worrying detachment from reality. All of these films, DC, X-Men, Marvel, are stupid escapism and CG showreels of varying quality. They're all live-action cartoons and should be viewed as such, bearing in mind that you're not going to get any real emotional or dramatic depth out of any of them. That's why the best ones are the ones that don't forget it, and it's why neither of the two comic book adaptations we've spoken about today are better than Deadpool. Still, X-Men Apocalypse takes second place in the rankings this year. Just. If you still have an appetite for comic book adaptations, it's a pretty solid choice. Not astoundingly brilliant, but perfectly fine. Sorry, Drew, your opinions thusly. Yeah, um, I'm broadly on on par with Scott there. Certainly... It has the same problems with so many of these films, these massive CGI set pieces, it's just almost impossible to care about. But yes, they're at least they're more inventive. The the Egyptian stuff at the beginning actually looks quite unlike anything you've seen in any of these other films. And it's rather entertaining for that. Although I do have a bit of a problem at the start. It's like I know that basically these mutants are magic, right? But all other films are set up to be that, you know, if some genetic mutation has happened they have these powers and then everything around it is medical or technical in some way scientific apart from the start of this film which is basically about magic that put me off a bit other than that yeah it's a it's a pretty entertaining film there are a lot of characters in this yes they do all seem to serve some purpose the quicksilver 
scene you spoke about, very similar to the one in Days of Future Past, entertaining if a bit incongruous, whereas it doesn't fit with the tone of the rest of the film, but it's pretty entertaining. And yeah, it's a it's a decent enough film, certainly not the best X-Men film. And I don't know what Ryan Singer is smoking with his crazy, crazy comments um, with, how did you put it, Scott, before? With the magic lady who controls the weather. <laughs> yeah. It's it's grounded. It's very, very grounded, you know, with, with, y- its, y- with yes. its magic indestructible man <laughs> and the girl who walks through walls. No, 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 it is. I'll distract him while you run. <laughs> <laughs> it also is lumbered and it's Oscar Isaac really bears the brunt of this. Um, it's sort of in the same thankless role that Lee Pace had in Gardens of the Galaxy. Being this sort of bluish, fully make up or made up, um, daft looking um, villain with some terrible, terrible dialogue. Is there some really mundane dialogue there that's up there with the likes of, do you know what happens to a toad when it's struck with lightning? <laughs> it's on that level. Like, <laughs> that, that, that line should still be with us even now, says so much. Yeah. There's a scene where Apocalypse is looking at his, his domain and he's going to take over the world. And he says, this was supposed to be my capital once. It will be. It's just, it's so terrible um, and leaden and mundane and awful. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're going to go that. about with a name like Apocalypse, you're going to have to work it harder than that, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other than that, I mean, yeah, most of the cast, I mean, they're well-worn roles to these people now. They're comfortable, but not like, for instance, Robert Downey Jr. Civil War. Nobody's phoning in, apart from Sophie Turner, who unfortunately got this role because she was famous in Game of Thrones but she's every bit as wooden in this as she is in Game of Thrones. There's a problem. Oh. I mean, I'm sure she tries, bless her, but she's not good, unfortunately. Um, she wasn't good as Sansa Stark. She's not good as Jean Grey, but fortunately, more or less, everybody around her is, is doing pretty well, so it's not so bad. I spoke um, to her earlier and she's gutted by your comments. <laughs> I am unrepentant. <laughs> uh, speaking of comments, Drew, what have our tweeps been telling us yes we have had a comment from the optimist the optimist cast on twitter who said they found come up with a summation of x my pockets was a tough one uh, our thoughts ended up being a mess with a bunch of pretty entertaining components tied together by a dumb villain um <laughs> but hey as summer blockbusters go you could do a lot worse than that cast <laughs> I just I just find it hard to be afraid of someone who's going about calling themselves Apocalypse. Do you know what I mean? It's a tremendously grandiose name, isn't it? It certainly is. That's up there. That's WWE territory. Do you know what I mean? Well, X-Men Frank wouldn't have had quite the same ring to it, I suppose. Well, I don't know. There's room there. Remember, it is more grounded in reality. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and I have you there, Ryan Singer. What a card. Problem- the problem with this is the same problem some of the Marvel films have had too. It's like when it, the entire world at stake, it's it's too much and it just becomes not interesting. Mm. Yes. Will Apocalypse destroy the world? No. Well, no, no it's the world. <laughs> right. We discussed this previously in some other yeah. podcast, right? And I said, yeah, once you raise the stakes that high, you, you remove all jeopardy because you know that's not possibly going to be the outcome. Not, not unless it's some sort of like $2 million budget indie flick. Yeah, um, that is perhaps a flaw with this one as well because they could at least have raised the stakes enough to actually kill some people when going mm-hmm. up against the most powerful mutant in the world. And, you know, it kind of doesn't really do that anyway. As well. no. it, it never really feels like there's any great danger to anyone. No, yeah, um, it's a definite problem. They just yeah. all dust themselves off at the end and say, well, that was close. Yep. <laughs> Sounds about right. Sounds about right. Fair enough then. Drew, I can't think of a link, so talk to me about the boss. <laughs> da- talk to me about the boss. That, I mean, that, you're on top form tonight, Craig. That was, that was amazing. The boss. So what, what a linking device you have created there. The, the boss. Boss. <laughs> <laughs> da boss da boss <laughs> talk to me about this Dubois character Drew <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, stop it, wasting wait, my time <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, I, I'm sorry Craig. I'm so contrite it's, uh, when Melissa McCarthy is funny she's generally very very funny Bridesmaids The Heat even with the incredible handicap of Sandra Bullock Spy <laughs> I, fi- I um, found her funny for the first time ever in Spy and when she's not funny, she's in the identity. boss. <laughs> <laughs> boss. In the interest of the edit, I'll stop now. 
Ja, altså, Dumbledore! <laughs> no, seriously, sorry. And which is not funny, she's Craig. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Touché. <laughs> uh, which is not funny, she's an identity thief. And uh, what those first three films have in common is that they were all directed by Paul Feig. The boss is not. So alarm bell should already be ringing. It is instead directed by McCarthy's husband, Ben Falcone, from a script penned by McCarthy, Falcone, and identity thief scribe Steve Mallory. <laughs> Sounds like a perfect storm. Mm. The story is about Michelle Darnell, an orphan constantly rejected by prospective families and returned to the orphanage, who grows up to be an enormously wealthy cross between Frank T.J. Mackey and, going by the stage show that follows the opening rejection montage, Iggy Azalea. <laughs> How exactly she became so successful is left largely unaddressed, but we quickly find out that she is guilty of insider trading, a crime of which she is convicted after the authorities are tipped off by a spurned lover and business rival, a wasted and frankly piss poor Peter Dinklage. After being released from prison, after a mere six months because it was a white collar crime and doesn't count, one of several failed attempts to film makes it satire. Darnell finds herself friendless, homeless and penniless and turns up on the doorstep of her put-upon former PA Claire, played by Kristen Bell. From here, she sets about restoring her business empire, with the obvious first step being to weaponize, almost literally, the door-to-door cookie-selling business of Claire's daughter's Girl Scout troop. Uh, McCarthy's character here is all over the place. One moment, a buffoonish clown, next a razor-sharp tycoon, and then an emotional cripple terrified of family, <laughs> and it never feels cohesive. Likewise, the plot, which drops or switches threads when it feels it can get a cheap gag to work. There are certainly funny moments. Adolescent girls and their mothers beating the snot out of each other in a gang fight in the streets was always going to be a winner, but they are, alas, few and far between. In, I almost wasn't going to mention this, but since it played in my mind so much, I think I should. In every scene, McCarthy wears turtlenecks, scarves, or some other high-collar clothing to hide her neck. <laughs> I am assuming she's hiding some sort of surgery scar, though it could be that it's simply an affectation the writers have given the character. However, it's never mentioned and it's such an out of place look that it becomes distracting. That is a very minor issue, however, compared to the fact that it's simply not consistently funny enough. Melissa McCarthy deserves better fare than this, and the squelchy sentimental plotline does her no favours, though she literally has only herself to blame here. Yes, it's, um... Pretty big failure on the part of everybody involved. Nice, uh, nice turtle not, not next recommended. though. Nice turtle. That's Dubois. <laughs> Scott, tell us about the nice guys. Ryan Gosling's Holland March may to be one of Ellie's best private detectives when he's not drunk, but there doesn't seem to be much of a window where he's not self-medicating with bourbon after the loss of his wife. Which seems a little harsh on his young daughter Holly, played by Angori Rice, who's by default the responsible one in the family. Uh, Russell Crowe's Jackson Healy is a bit like a kissogram, except rather than delivering a message with a smack on the lips, it's a more generalised full body smackdown. He's thinking about getting out of the hired thug game, but not before delivering a beating to Holland, warning him off pursuing his latest case. However, when Healy is double crossed, he goes back to Holland and proposes that they team up and continue the case trying to track down, if you'll permit some simplification, the reasons why people associated with a recently shot porn film keep showing up dead. Of course, things are not what they seem, and a number of twists and turns later sees Healy and Holland up against an unlikely powerful interest, but one that's not afraid to silence anyone who stands in their way. Which sounds a bit grim, but as with the similarly themed Shane Black outing, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, it's played more for laughs than drama. Indeed, the short of this review essentially boils down to, if you like to Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and you're not a monster, of course you like to Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, <laughs> then you'll like the nice guys. Gosling plays a fine, pathetic loser role, showing just enough of the decent human being that he was at one point to keep him likeable despite his actions, and he has a very fine line in panicked yelps. There's good chemistry between him and Crow, who's also doing a good job of taking a not particularly sympathetic character and engendering sympathy for them. And crucially, they all have pretty good comic timing, which helps in making this the funniest and most enjoyable film I've seen in cinema since Deadpool. I hear conflicting reports on how easy to follow the narrative is. I 
I didn't have too much trouble, but to be honest, it's so ludicrous that there's not much point in treating it as anything more than a loose linking device anyway. So, some nice action scenes, a nice sleazy 70s uh, setting, uh, sharp dialogue, great performances, and overall it's a very funny bloody cop outing, the likes of which are sadly all too rare these days. Highly enjoyable film and well worth seeking out. An extra point for not being the boss. I think I've worn that thin now. Drew? Greg? You looking forward to Christmas? Not particularly. Excellent. Was Warcraft. I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, what were your thoughts on the nice guys? More or less what Scott said, with the exception of, I wouldn't compare it to Deadpool because I thought that was a steaming turd, but yeah, it's deeply funny. It's not Shane Black's only trick because he did do a very good job in Iron Man, but he does do a particularly good job in buddy cop drama mm-hmm. with comedy in it. It's just a deeply entertaining film. As Scott said, Russell Crowe in particular manages to make his character, who's not very likeable, quite sympathetic, which uh, just proves that Russell Crowe really is a good actor because sometimes he doesn't seem like the most sympathetic person and to take a fairly (laughs) unsympathetic role and make it sympathetic Mm. is quite a trick. Yeah, it's a really, really, really funny film. That's all you need to know. Go and watch it. Yay! I should have been talking about The Nice Guys tonight, but I can't because my opportunity to see it fell through. So... I still haven't seen my man Ryan Gosling on the big screen yet. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? That, Craig, is a tragedy. I know. And now he won't return my calls. Yes. Oh, never mind. There's always Blade Runner 2. Uh, and that leaves us with Warcraft, which, Scott, you are going to tell us a bit about. Yeah, so Warcraft is the beginning, to give it a Sunday name. Based on the hit video game is most commonly a dire warning when it comes to films, so I figured it'd be interesting to see if that remains the case when a hefty budget is thrown at something, and more importantly, it's Mm. a director whose previous work I've been rather fond of took the helm. I've no great experience with the game of late, having touched nary a second of the phenomenally popular World of Warcraft. I did play a bit of Warcraft 3 back in the early 2000s and some of the recent card game Hearthstone, but that's not helpful when talking about the lore of the world, if you will. So I'm essentially coming to this film as I'd assume the majority of the target audience would. Essentially blind. Knowing maybe the name, but little else. In terms of the actual film itself, we're introduced to Duncan Jones's CG heavy take on the material as a warband of orcs, bechieftained by the necromancer Gul'dan, voiced by Daniel Wu, opens up a portal from their dying homeworld to the world of Azeroth, currently a peaceful high fantasy land of humans, dwarfs, elves, and anything else from the Lord of the Rings that Blizzard wanted to nick back in the day. <laughs> In this film, though, we're only really concerned with humans, headed by King Lane Ridden, played by Dominic Cooper. When word reaches him that villages are being pillaged and the villagers hauled off, he dispatches right-hand man Andwin Lothar, played by Travis Fimmel, to find out what's going on and to raise the AWOL Guardian of the Realm Medivh, Ben Foster. He's a powerful magician, but has not been seen of late. On the way there, Lothar stumbles across a rather less powerful but still pretty useful mage, Khadgar, played by Ven Schnitzer. There is also some discontent in the ranks of the orcs, however, as while their warchief and many of his minions are on board the Conquest Trail, some noticed that their home hadn't been dying before this necromancy fiesta started, and the same corruption has followed them through to Azeroth, almost as though they're the baddies. In particular, the Flostwolf clan, headed by Duratan, voiced by Toby Kebble, figures out that he'd better contact the humans and ask for their help in overthrowing Gul'dan and restoring honour to the orc clans rather than keeping his lot thrown in with the bad guys. Acting as a bridge between the human and orc protagonists is Garona Half-Orkin, played by Paula Patton, who is, as her name applies, half-orc, half-human, and agrees to help the humans, but... The question is, can these alliances hold, and has the corruption of the dark magic Gul'dan wields affected any of those in Azeroth? These are the questions that Jones hopes will sustain the mercifully restrained two-hour narrative, leading up to a climactic battle between humans and orcs. And, well, it just about does, as far as I'm concerned, but it's a tough film to really go to bat for. If you've paid any attention to the reviews, this has been almost universally buried, and I'm almost left wishing I could be overwhelmingly positive to provide some balance. However, Warcraft doesn't provide all that much excitement, so it's difficult to translate that into a strong defence. 
There's a very strong and consistent aesthetic applied to the world, which makes the orcs much more relatable and impressive than I'd expected, but at the cost of making the human's world look just a little bit weird. Not bad exactly, but off-putting enough to start triggering whatever the uncanny vanny analogue is for buildings and such like. It left me with the distinct impression that the CG stylistics were unsettled, is as good a word as I can come up with for it. And narratively, it's not much more than competent. It manages a somewhat rare trick of having a great many things going on, but not making much of that seem particularly important, leading up to a final battle that actually wasn't all that engaging at the end of the day. Performance-wise, the orcs seem to get rather more attention and characterization than the humans do, which is nice, but it does leave Dominic Cooper in particular, but really all of the cast of humans, spinning their wheels with underdeveloped characters, making the piece feel a little bit thin and flimsy. While there's a couple of barbed lines and lighter moments, for the most part everything is presented very seriously and straight-laced, and I'm left with the impression of it being very po-faced. There's just not enough fun on display, which is perhaps the heart of my complaint with the film. It's a more or less competent piece of filmmaking, but it's not really any fun, and that's what I wanted from this. So then, overall, it is resoundingly mediocre, which is still much better than the slew of negative reviews would imply, but it's quite hard to recommend it to anyone, even people such as himself, fans of fantasy films. Probably even those guys shouldn't make much of an effort to see this. I'm heartened somewhat by its huge success in China, which should guarantee a sequel on that nation's returns alone, not necessarily as vindication for the film, but because there's a really good setting for stories in the world of Warcraft, and I'd like to see that better utilised, especially given that we're hardly overrun with other fantasy film options. Warcraft at the beginning isn't a great film, but it's a reasonable base from which to build something great. I'll look forward to that film, but in all likelihood I will entirely forget about this one. <laughs> Well, there you go then. Before we wrap up tonight, Drew, what other interactions and shout-outs have we got from social media? We did put out a call asking if anybody had any particular subjects they'd like us to cover. Mm -hmm. So far, only our friend Tengushi at Tengushi on Twitter has responded, saying he wants us to cover Bucky O'Hare LARPing. <laughs> so if anybody has any better suggestions, we're can still open do. to them. Strong can do. <laughs> I noticed that one of us did find a rather disturbing... Bucky O'Hare leather mask on Oh, Etsy. is that what that was? <laughs> sorry. I guess Scott found that one I'm then. So, um, be, yeah, uh, sorry, a penny just dropped there. <laughs> so yeah, certainly that's um, something we can keep on the back burner for now. But let's never say never. Yes, if you ha can think of any other topics you'd like us to cover, that we're open to your suggestions. And we will, of course, steal the best ones without credit. <laughs> now, we're open to hearing what you'd like to hear from us. And we do have a, a couple of new reviews on iTunes that we'd like to mention and thank the, the reviewers for leaving for us. First of all, by the vowelist named Stricker 241 <laughs> Flawless pronunciation. Oh my, is there no end to your linguistic prowess, Drew? <laughs> Yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're just pan-linguist. You know all the language languages. From the magic of Google, I, I know that that's Turner Hodsall who does the very good Movie Saurus Rex podcast, so shout out and recommendation for that. Thank you, Turner. We'll be blow our own trumpet by saying what other people have said through their trumpet about us. Mm -hmm. um, mm, trumpet to trumpet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, cheek like to cheek. <laughs> this is a great film podcast. The opinions of the hosts are always considered without coming across as film snobs. The show is light, fun and filled with laughs too, which is always nice. So thank you very much for that. Your tenor is in the mail. Also over on the US store. I so say you can leave us reviews whichever country you're in. That's fine. First of all, the Whatnots left us an episode, particularly focusing on our Tech Noir episode. And left us a review. As a huge fan of Tech Noir styled films, but not super well versed in them, I was super excited about this episode, and now I can't wait to hear more from them. These guys have great insight on the films they talk about, great sound quality, and are very entertaining. Give them a subscribe. So it looks we've filled at least one person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you know those boys are good because they like brick. So Yeah, absolutely. Yes. The boys have taste. And they introduced me to the joiners in 3D as well. Those those guys know what they're talking about, so I would heartily recommend you follow them as well. Um, and they also have a review by Random Red, um, who Scott is going to decrypt the identity of for me. Yes, these are the guys behind the London is Blue Chelsea FC soccer podcast. I have to admit, I've not actually listened to those podcasts yet because I'm not a Chelsea FC fan because... 
I don't really care about football, sorry. Um, but I'm sure if, you, if you're the kind of person who wants to get some knowledge about the Chelsea FC, then give those guys a hit up. And they said, instead of focusing a singular film, these guys put together a show that covers wider thoughts and genres. Ultimately, this allows for some more in-depth conversation thanks to comparisons between multiple films. Thanks for the show, I highly recommend it. And thanks very much for your review. That's bloody nice, Appreciate thank it. you, yes. Yes, and just while it's sitting in front of me, we'll, we thank a while back, the guys on the Magic Lantern podcast, mm-hmm. for their review a while back, but I'll just plug that podcast again because, frankly, it's very, very good and you should all be listening to it. It's one I, of the I don't best. know why you're listening to us. Go listen to them. <laughs> And Cole, I think I might have said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Cole and Erica have got two such relaxing voices. If you can't justify or afford a nice, smooth, I, my analogy is falling apart. Even as I never mind, subscribe to their podcast. <laughs> talking of it's relaxing like pouring honey voices, in your though. ear. So as a, a link that actually works for you tonight, Craig. We're talking of relaxing voices as you were. Mm. Oh, like I see say, where you're going. Yeah. Jesus, it's like telepathy, Drew. <laughs> It's unbelievable. I'd like to thank um, Ian McCracken at IanCMCC on Twitter for his kind words a few days ago. He said that, well, Fuzz and Film, you're now what I habitually listen to to put the baby to sleep. Congratulations. <laughs> um, <laughs> while entertaining me mightily, I believe your accent soothes his text and ears. Something for everyone. So I think as long as we're entertaining the parent and putting the baby to sleep, that's the right way around and we're okay there. <laughs> yep. And Ian, as I was saying to these guys just before we started in relation to your comment, if you want to return the favour, that would be fantastic because neither of my two kids are particularly soothed by my voice. So, <laughs> you know, maybe if I send you a script or something, you can pop me an MP3 back by email. I don't know. Oh dear. And I think that just about covers it then. Oh, some lovely feedback there. That's actually quite heartening. So thank you very much to everyone who's been in touch, uh, especially the guys who uh, have left us a, a review on iTunes, but not exclusively, just anyone who's taken time out to contact us via any of the uh, social media channels. Uh, reach out, out to us in uh, pretty much any way you can possibly imagine. Uh, a heartfelt thanks. That's that's really generous. And I think this this podcast marks the, the best response we've had yet uh, in terms of the feedback we've got since our last episode so yes massive thank you all round if you want to hit us up on social media you can do it from the obvious addresses yes. Twitter that's at Fuds on Film uh, we're on the Facebooks as well which is facebook.com slash Fuds on Film or if you just want to write like an old style person you can do so at, from email at podcast at Fuds on Film.com. indeed our next podcast is going to be landing on the first of it's the going month. to be a disaster it's going to be a total disaster because we'll be talking about disaster movies um, and I'm not, I'm not going to say any more than that uh, but look out <laughs> look out for that episode you've been absolutely lovely I have been Craig Eastman Scott Morris was Scott Morris goodbye and Drew Tavendale was and forever shall be Drew Tavendale catch you on the flip side